Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual author talk. Um, it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today, Cheryl Woodruff Brooks. She has an MBA and MA and completed her first book, which is the subject of today's talk, Chicken Bone Beach, the pictorial history of Atlantic City's Missouri Avenue Beach in 2017, which was nominated for a 2017 Literary Award with the Schomburg Center in New York City. It has been used in classrooms at Purdue University, referenced in the Oxford Handbook of American Folklore and Folklife Studies, and is available even in libraries in Johannesburg, South Africa. Cheryl's second book, Golden Beauty Boss, the story of Madame Sarah Spencer Washington and the Apex Empire, was released three weeks after the pandemic, which is the first biography written about an African-American woman who became a self-made millionaire in the 1940s. Cheryl's third book, The Story of Chicken Bone Beach, was released in 2021 and is the children's versions of her debut book, Chicken Bone Beach. It was awarded the 2021 Sunny Award for being the best-selling children's book with her publisher. This year, Cheryl has released a children's version of Golden Beauty Boss, and Cheryl's first independent release, When I Look Into the Sea, is a rhyming children's book designed to encourage kids to believe in themselves and their dream, dreams. So thank you so much, Cheryl, for coming back. We had you last year to talk about uh, Sarah Spencer Washington, and we're delighted to have you back now to talk about um, Missouri Avenue Beach in Atlantic City as we gear up for the summer months. So um, before we jump into Cheryl's presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Cheryl's presentation, but please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. There will be a survey available at the end of the webinar, so if you have time, we ask that you please complete the survey. We always love hearing your feedback. And if you want more information about Cheryl and some of her works, she has her own website, which is on the screen there. So you can visit CherylWBrooksAuthor.com if you want to pick up some of her books or kind of learn more about what Cheryl has done. One last thing before we jump into Cheryl's presentation, I just want to do a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you will notice your audio settings. You can check here if you're using an external listening device, such as a headset or earbuds, to make sure that everything is connected properly. At any point during the presentation, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that. That will alert me and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to solve any problems that you're having. And as I mentioned before, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A buttons. That'll send me them and we'll address them at the end of Cheryl's presentation. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Sh Carol. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me again, Andrew. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be uh, informing an audience of a little piece of American history. So uh, welcome everyone who's here. I'm so grateful you tuned in. Uh, so you've kind of already got an intro about me. I really don't need to say much more. So let's get started. You can go to the next slide, Andrew. So I'll be talking about Chicken Bone Beach. Um, and this is the book that Andrew referred to um, that you can most certainly purchase on my website and on various sites out there. Uh, this book was my master thesis. Um, I attended Penn State Harrisburg and got my master's in American studies. And of course I had to write a thesis. I had no idea what topic it would be, but you know, sometimes things come to you. So um, the summer of 2014, I was visiting a girlfriend in Philadelphia, and we walked past a gallery. We saw this picture, um, 
of people on Chicken Bone Beach in Atlantic City and through the window saw that there were about 20 more photos. So I said, let, you know, let's go in, let's check this out because I'll be very honest, rarely have I seen historical images of my race looking so happy and having so much fun and so many smiles, you know. So that's what really tweaked my curiosity, wanting to know where is this place? And I know these pictures, you know, could be 40, 50 years ago. And so that's what drew my attention. I didn't think much of it after that visit. I bought a few postcards. I went back home that summer. And when I returned to school in the fall, it just so happens that the American Studies Eastern Conference was being held in New Jersey. And there was a call for papers about history in New Jersey and I remembered those postcards. I said, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do something on that. And that's how the whole Chicken Bone Beach became a part of my own path. You can go to the next slide. So here's a picture of Chicken Bone Beach, probably in the early 1900s. And just to give you a bit of a backdrop, how did African-Americans um, end up living in Atlantic City to begin with. Well, there was a slave owner, a Dutch slave owner by the name of James Soma. And he was curious about this area that is now called Atlantic City at that time was called Absecon, which means the place of swans. It was named Absecon by the Lenape tribe of Native Americans who were residing there first. Um, but people that lived in the area began to hear about this really beautiful area and were curious as James Soma was. So what he did was he gathered a group of his slave women and said, if you create a path for me to get to Absecon, when you get there, you are free. So I, I really find that fascinating that um, the migration to Atlantic City or what became Atlantic City eventually uh, came to pass um, by a way of earning freedom. I just think that's just a fascinating little piece of information. Um, but also, during those early, the early 1900s, Atlantic City became more of an integrated city. Um, blacks and whites lived on both sides of towns. Um, They're kind of split up by the train tracks. They call it a north side and a south side. And the African-Americans lived on the south, the north side of the tracks. And most others lived on the south side. But in the early beginnings of Atlantic City, Blacks and whites were integrated, attending the same churches, in some cases, owning property on both sides of town, and having their own businesses. Now, there weren't a lot of skills for African Americans once they were uh, given their freedom, but they did find trades that they were very good at, like repairing shoes, for example. So people were, and then um, let me back up for a minute, and also um, African-Americans who were uh, listed in the army and in the military in general, um, they had a source of income as well. You can go to the next slide. So those people you saw in that photo, um, and many other African-Americans started to make a home for themselves on the North side. And I didn't wanna leave that part out. And so they physically were already very close to Missouri Avenue Beach or the folklore term, Chicken Bone Beach. So now let's talk about Chicken Bone Beach. Chicken Bone Beach was established as Missouri Avenue Beach in 1939. 
So that's its real name. And yes, you can go there. And if you already live there, maybe you know. But if you go there now, you will see an historical marker that was erected, I believe, while I was working on my thesis, in fact, or maybe once I finished it. And you will see um, a picture from the same collection that I used for my research. These photos are property of Temple University. They are in the public domain. Um, I probably looked at about mm, a thousand images, but John W. Mosley, he took about 30,000 pictures. Um, there was a time in Atlantic City that there would be millions of people at the beach. It's just unbelievable when I looked at Atlantic City's patrol records and saw that they would, I don't know how they even did it, but they kept track of the count. So there would be as many as 8 million people on all the beaches uh, in the 1950s. Another bit of integrated information is that blacks and whites, they were both lifeguards all over the beaches. Pete Turner was the first African-American lifeguard all the way back in 1913. So then we fast forward time a little bit and Jim Crow laws begin to become more enforced around America. Thereby, in some cases, I would say forcing might be a strong word, but forcing the North to oblige in many ways. And uh, when that happened, Pete Turner and other Blacks had to only work at Chicken Bone Beach. So they went from saving anyone to being told they could only save people at Missouri Avenue Beach. You can go to the next slide. So, very close to Chicken Bone Beach. Here we are near the boardwalk. Um, if if the picture were larger than to the left of this image, you would be walking towards the north side, the north side of Atlantic City. The north side of Atlantic City is where most African-Americans lived who lived in Atlantic City. Um, they could not live anywhere else. Um, they were forced to only rent or buy property on the north side of town. Um, I can no longer see the slides, Andrew, but can are they still there? Yeah, they are. Okay. I don't know why they disappeared from my screen, but I'll just keep going. Um, maybe they'll come back. I don't know what just what just happened. So um, on the north side of town for many, many, many years, um, African-Americans went, went without paved streets or parks um, or basketball court. So pretty much the beach became more than just uh, a place to go swim and enjoy time with their family. It ultimately became um, a lot of things that African Americans needed. It was it was a place for kids to play, um, and to experience, um, you know, having extracurricular activities that didn't exist in their neighborhood. Um, I feel so weird without seeing the slide. So I'm going to ask you to go to the next one. And maybe just tell me what it is. Maybe I'll bring up my power. It's John Mosley. All right. So a little bit more about John Mosley. So all of these images you see, they are products of his work. John W. Mosley was a self-taught photographer from Philadelphia. And I don't know if he really realized it, but at a time in our history where um, there wasn't a lot of African-American history being documented, 
Um, he historicalized a lot of Black history, uh, predominantly on the in the eastern region of the United States by way of photos. I mean, I focused on the images that related to the beach, but he has images uh, catching um, African-American athletes as far back as the 1950s. Um, he attended a lot of civic events. So I'm just so grateful that this, this person who's now deceased and we're all really getting to appreciate a lot of his images. I, I'm so grateful that he snapped away. He took so many wonderful images. And of course he was doing it for a living. Many of his photos ended up in uh, African-American newspapers and magazines uh, throughout the United States, in fact. And uh, I was told by Dr. Richland Goddard um, who is from Atlantic City, and I relied very heavily on her thesis. Um, she told me, you know, why they ended up with so many pictures, Cheryl? No, well, let's go back in time and think about how we used to take pictures. So John W. Mosley would go to Chicken Bone Beach, take pictures, go back to Philadelphia, develop them, go back to Chicken Bone Beach in the hopes that he may see most of the people if he didn't already make some type of exchange, you know, and that is how he ended up with so many different images. Um, if you don't recognize the image to the very far right, let me draw your attention to the very handsome young man in the polka dot hat in the polka dot shirt. That is the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Chicken Bone Beach. You know, Chicken Bone Beach was a very safe haven for the Black community in Atlantic City, but across the U.S. due to the fact that the, the, the racial climate was still very tense. Um, and not everyone welcomed, not every business offered services um, for Blacks to recreate. And so, of course, word got out, and it particularly got out because Atlantic City Black business owners started to list their businesses in the green book. I kind of call it the, it's kind of the AAA guide at that time to know uh, where to go that you could be accommodated um, in a safe place. So it got really popular. And you will see if you purchase the book or look for images elsewhere that it was um, an attraction to go to Chicken Bone Beach by civic leaders, by celebrities, uh, by many college students looking for work. So Chicken Bone Beach developed a reputation across America um, and kind of reminds me along the lines of uh, Bourbon Street in New Orleans um, or, yeah, that's a good example. It was a party town. I mean, Atlantic City in general, in their heyday, it, it was a place to go and just set yourself free and have a good time. Um, and it was well known um, as a, a very attractive place for both blacks and whites to come and vacation. Um, one of the things I ended up finding out was that Prince Albert honeymooned in Atlantic City. You see, Atlantic City was one of the first cities uh, on the Eastern region to provide transportation from the South to the North. So they built two railroads in the early 1900s. And that's how they were able to like build their town as this resort town. Uh, because a lot of people had a lot of great ideals about what to do with Atlantic City uh, economically, but 
a doctor got a group of investors and they they decided to get in get more people to invest in a railroad that would bring tourists, make it easy for them to come there. So they were popular with those huge, amazing hotels along the coastline. And this was a time where there was no Vegas yet. Um, there was no Disneyland or world. So for a good chunk of three or four decades, Atlantic City was making a lot of money. Um, and both races benefited. Uh, African-Americans, uh, you can go to the next slide, Andrew. <laughs> Not only did African Americans have their own set of lifeguards, they also had their own set of medics. Um, and you see here, I vaguely put in the picture that uh, unlike uh, the protocols of the rest of the country, Blacks most certainly treated anyone who came to the North side and lots of different people did. Um, and of course, uh, African-Americans were not the only, I would say, suppressed group of people in America. Um, my understanding it is that Chicken Bone Beach also attracted um, the gay population because they didn't feel comfortable at other beaches back then. Um, kind of a the, the hippie crowd. Uh, was drawn to uh, Chicken Bone Beach as well. You know, that generation, it was more like my mother's generation, the Woodstock era, those folks that um, started to develop a more liberal mindset, um, as well as some Jews in Atlantic City. And you can go to the next slide. Are you there? Yep, from servants to eye candy. Okay, that's right. I can't see it. So, um, so um, whites began to travel to Atlantic City um, and enjoy um, the beautiful hotels and the, the extraordinary boardwalk, um, but they did not particularly care for the ideal of co-mingling with blacks at that time and remember for um for a lot of whites that were vacationing up north they've never they never witnessed integration of both races so they were very un uncomfortable with that and that's understandable they they just it's not something um they ever saw acceptable they complained to the hotel owners um, that they would not patronize their business unless they made sure that Blacks were not on the other beaches. So, um, it, and it was supposedly done very subtly. Um, and this was shared with me taking oral histories from Henrietta Shelton, who started a nonprofit called Chicken Bone Beach. She told me there were letters sent by hotel owners to black churches in Atlantic City, basically telling them in so many words, you're only allowed to be at Missouri Avenue Beach. And if you're not at that beach, then you'll lose your jobs in the hotels. And so they obliged, of course. There weren't a lot of choices for work um, for a lot of African-Americans post-slavery. They knew, of course, how to cook, how to clean, how to care for children, how to just do basic um, different skilled labors. So they went along with it. But I like showing this picture because it does show um, how at one point in time, they were, African-Americans were employed at these hotels and then it came a day when they started to become entrepreneurs. African-Americans in Atlantic City by the 1940s had opened roughly 235 Black-owned businesses. 
um, and mostly out of necessity. They opened uh, a credit union, drugstores, restaurants, taxi services, everything, every amenity that they needed um, that they could not rely on the South side. So I think in many ways, that was a blessing in disguise for the race because it empowered them economically to be able to care for themselves and their community. I think it was a, a wonderful act of collaboration as well. You can go to the next slide. So you're looking at, again, some of um, the work of John W. Mosley. Um, yeah, just getting back to the the very uh, the glitz and the glamour of hanging out on Chicken Bone Beach. Um, I interviewed people that said, you know, oh, I'm, I wanted to make sure I always looked really nice when I went. It was very fashionable. I just love that. I love that there was a time, you know, when people um, really looked forward to getting all dialed up and you know, going to the beach and being seen, but especially at Chicken Bone Beach, because you got folks like John W. Mosley getting photos in magazines. You know, um, you got, I've had people tell me, Rem remember when we were young, honey? And I believe they ran into Muhammad Ali on the beach and he picked her up. So the one woman told me how when she's a little girl, she ran into Muhammad Ali and he picked her up on the beach. So it was like Hollywood little Hollywood on, you know, in New Jersey being at Chicken Bone Beach. So what you see in front of you is Color Magazine. So to the left, Color Magazine was in circulation for about 17 years. Um, and it was mirrored off Life Magazine. So if you haven't, I don't know the ages of people on here, but if you haven't heard of Life Magazine, you know, do some Googling. It was really popular in its day. I remember being over my my grandparents and they haven't, them having a subscription. But um, John W. Mosley had three months that he was allowed to have the centerfold and what he did was he gathered people that came from different cities and did these shoots. So these are women from New York, Philadelphia. Um, I did not, I do not recall every page, but I'm sure that some of the um, states most adjacent to New Jersey, there are probably groups there too. Virginia might've had a group, Maryland, so the bulk of the African-American population that frequented Chicken Bone Beach on a regular, that's where they were coming from. Maryland, Virginia, New York, Philadelphia, um, but, but, but other places as well. There were other segregated beaches around America. There were. So um, Chicken Bone Beach was not a, like one of the only few um, I just think that because of their um, great success as entrepreneurs in promoting their beach and having all these nightclubs that have like Nina Simone and Sammy Davis Jr. and Ray Charles all, you know, constantly playing there all summer, um, that that really helped uh, draw the uh the kind of people, the kind of uh, draw of, of crowds. They also got involved, meaning the African-American community and business owners. They also held quite a few large engagements such as they hosted a Democratic National Convention um, one year. And they also um, would do like sororities and fraternities there was one that was really popular called Omega by the Sea. So there's an African-American fraternity that has hundreds of members and they would host events there too. So I asked, I interviewed um, Nelson Johnson. He's a retired judge from, from New Jersey. I said, well, I'm really surprised that the whites in Atlantic City 
in power, you know, politically and large business owners, they didn't try to stop African Americans from being their own bosses. And he brought to my attention how really small Atlantic City is. So he painted a, he said it wasn't about being black. It was about being green. Um, Atlantic City, they become well known as this great tourist town. So they wanted to give a seamless impression that the entire town was an attractive place to vacation, even if you were going to Chicken Bone Beach. So I think that really speaks a lot to the people who were involved at that point, that they said, you know, we can make a whole lot of restrictions and stop African-Americans from succeeding on their own, but we won't because we want a town that succeeds. So it was almost a win-win. You can go to the next slide. All right, more pictures. More pictures. <clears throat> I just really wanted you guys to have a chance to just see all the amazing different type of shots the diversity of people um, who frequented Chicken Bone Beach. Um, and you'll see that it, it, was, a, it was an area that um, not, not only attracted just African-Americans, and that's one thing that I really, really like about it. And my goodness, I mean, if I were visiting Atlantic City, I'd think, wow, everybody's gorgeous. Um, and what helped that too is, you know, Atlantic City is the founder of the Miss America pageant as well. So it just seemed to be a town that where the beautiful people resided, if that makes any sense. But yeah, beautiful women everywhere. You can go to the next slide. We have the jazz club. So I just want you to see too. I, I, oh, these are my these are my nineteen seventies hippie crowd over there on the left. Um, but also on the right is Club Harlem. Um, club Harlem was one of the most famous nightclubs um, in Atlantic City on Kentucky Avenue. And when I tell you that the nightclubs in, in the Chicken Bone Beach area were so popular that there would be crowds, lines of people wrapped around the corner waiting to get in. And they were black and white because the commonality was jazz music. Whites love jazz music, blacks love jazz music. And that sort of boom, that just broke the color line that that not just you know a white person here and a white person there but a long line of whites all waiting to get in to see one of these shows and entertainment was such a huge success that people like Sammy Davis Jr he gave five shows a day he did a breakfast set lunch brunch dinner uh wow you know and it was it carried on like that for a while for decades uh chris colombo you'll see his name on that picture i might as well mention him since his name is there but he's a native atlantic city person very famous drummer who is now deceased i did read his oral history that that he gave to the atlantic city free public library um he had a lot of great opportunities and was um, discovered, tapped by Frank Sinatra himself. Um, so he worked a lot with Frank, Frank Sinatra along with other um, really well-known jazz artists of the day. He says in uh, his oral history um, that there was a time, I guess when he was young, he would go horseback riding at Chicken Bone Beach 
and then go to school. That's really cool. I wish I could have gone horseback riding before I went to school, but I love hearing stories like that, you know, and for a lot of events I attended in Atlantic City while I was doing all my research, I also thought that I'd ask people of color who could swim. <laughs> um, statistically, um, the CDC is reporting like millions of African Americans who don't know how to swim at all to this day, you know, in this current times. But it was very interesting that everybody asked, everybody I asked for my research said yes. And they kind of even looked at me sometimes like, come on. Uh, but statistically, our race, <laughs> we, we, we don't, we either haven't been exposed to lessons or just never learn. But Blacks in uh, Atlantic City, they told me they surfed, they swam, um, they knew they were lifeguards. And I, I was so pumped to hear that. Um, and to show you how life kind of comes full circle in some cases, um, I spoke at an event called Black Girl Beach Day, which is now taking place on Chicken Bone Beach. And it's been doing it, I think, for the since 2019. So I participated in 2019 with a group of millennial age girls from Camden, New Jersey, who decided they would start holding an event there uh, for women, women of color of all ages to just kind of have this fun day on the beach. But when I did it, um, they, they were dancing and jumping rope and doing different things like that. Those young ladies are now giving people swimming lessons for this one day event. And they're teaching them how to surf again. So I'm excited because I love water and beaches. You can go to the next slide. The glamour and glitz. Now, here's some more of the pretty people I was telling you about. So, you know, in between sets, where did most of these great singers go? They went to Chicken Bone Beach. So, yeah, if you're really lucky, you might run into Sammy Davis and joe lewis a boxer before my time was, was also at the beach as well um and this kind of uh this was a regular this was a this was a normal thing at Chip, chicken bone beach and just to give you a little clue of you know we're already living in a country where we're dealing with this separation of races at this time but within the black community at chicken bone beach there was also separation by color as well what do you know uh and let me explain that it appeared as such that those of a lighter complexion were privy to cabanas and nicer parts of the beach. <laughs> so we within our own race were dividing ourselves by skin tone. That's a whole nother thing. Colorism, that's the term. But yeah, I can write about that, but that's not what I'm doing. So I just wanted to um, bring that to your attention. You can go to the next slide, which again, other pictures of other folks on the beach. And I don't, is this the one? I don't know if this is the one I really wanted to show you. Just wanted to show you some of the characters um, at, at the beach. And I'll tell you about one picture that's not showing. Uh, there was a man, and I do have his picture in my book. He would bring champagne to the beach every time he went. And he bring enough like to pass it out to people so he became known as I think Champagne Charlie or Champagne Stanley and he he would be giving out uh champagne to his friends so people really got um 
they really felt some kind of way about hanging out at Chicken Beach. And I believe the African-Americans really took pride in the popularity of what they turned into, you know, this Black resort within their own community. Um, if you've been to the Smithsonian's African-American Museum to, uh, just to bring to your attention before we wrap this up, they do have um, some parts of Club Harlem there. Um, I forgot what I saw when I went, but yeah, pieces of Club Harlem are now at the Smithsonian as well as some artifacts of Sarah Spencer Washington, who I also wrote about. Um, she is most likely the third African-American woman in the country to have become a millionaire. And uh, I don't think a lot of people really knew her story, but she lived in Atlantic City. So she was another really um, impactful piece of this North Side community in Atlantic City because she was a job creator uh, in, in, the, in the, probably the largest way of most businesses. She opened up a, a manufacturing plant. So she employed in the 1940s, like 200 employees uh, all working in her plant. And she was just a very generous phil philanthropic woman as well. She, she rented a plane and had coal coupons flown and just dropped off over Atlantic City so people could warm their, their homes uh, in the winter if they couldn't afford it. Not just in the north side of town. She had the planes fly across all of Atlantic City. So I love hearing that part about her as well. So I hope you have enjoyed just a little window into what this part of our country was like in its heyday for at least four to five decades. And, you know, my takeaways have always been that I really love the collaboration and cooperation that was taking place in Atlantic City. Um, yes, there was racism, um, but in many cities, people chose to take a more subtle approach, if you will, uh, where you may go to a, a, a different city where you just blatantly see a sign that says no Blacks, that kind of thing. But everyone that I spoke to there said, you just knew your place. You just knew, you know, where to not be. And you, you may get nudged to, you know, move along or away from certain parts of the boardwalk. But there wasn't anyone that I interviewed that said they felt this sense of you know, really harsh treatment, but that's not to say it didn't exist because the people I interviewed did give examples of scenarios when um, they were treated differently. But nevertheless, you don't hear that much about this type of uh, community collaboration amongst races and um, the fact that these people also were able to build a strong middle class. So the African-American population there by the 1940s also had 12% of their population was middle class. Um, so those are some of the things that I, I just really um, enjoy hearing about um, this piece of history. Um, what I'm working on now well, you know, when I go out and do presentations and I participate in book events, people, they either ask me about other beaches or they tell me what they know because of their own experiences. So I'm currently researching, basically trying to find out all I can about the history of all once segregated Black beaches in America. And from that research, um, you know, just catalog it is one piece, but to make some overall analysis of 
the movement that was taking place on the water that we haven't quite documented as much as what I would say the civil rights movement taking place on the land of America. So I want to thank you all so very much for taking your time out today to be informed about uh, history in New Jersey. And I'm on all social media. Please feel free to follow me at Cheryl W. Brooks. That's my tagline for Facebook. Um, just go down the, the list. TikTok. I'm on Snapchat. I'm on Instagram. You know, you got to be everywhere. So um, again, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to submit them via the chat or the Q&A button, and we'll be happy to address them. All right. Let's see what we have. Um, sorry if I missed this. Why was the beach name changed specifically to Chicken Bone Beach? Where did the new name come from? That's a very good question. I'm asked that question a lot. So let's just um, clarify that the actual name of Chicken Bone Beach is Missouri Avenue Beach. Um, you're not going to, well, you will, I don't know if it comes up on any kind of maps now, but it's Missouri Avenue Beach. The name supposedly came from beach workers who clean the beach at the end of the day. Um, and it had to do with the fact that Blacks were not allowed to patronize any other restaurants on the boardwalk. So they bought their own picnic baskets to the beach. And supposedly chicken holds up better in the heat than a lot of proteins. So, um, yeah, Blacks were taking their own food with them to the beach, and um, it just turned out that seagulls, they like chicken bones. <laughs> so I think, you know, they, it, some, of course, made it into garbage cans, but a lot of times, I'm sure people just threw the chicken bones down. And so when it came time to just do that sweep over the sand, the workers were finding all these bones and they started to call Chicken Bone Beach, Chicken Bone Beach. And there's another Chicken Bone Beach in Pensacola, Florida. Don't know how they got their nickname, but it would be pretty amusing if it came about the same way, but it's folklore. I will say too, as I interviewed folks, that there were pros and cons about that name. Everybody wasn't excited about that name. They, they, some were offended, um, but I went with it because once I met Henrietta Shelton and I saw that she had embraced that name and she grew up there. And of everybody I ever interviewed, no one was more pumped and enthusiastic and just a burst of positivity about Chicken Bone Beach than her. So I said, hey, if she, she loves it so much, so do I. All righty, let's see what else we have. Um, I'm a graduate student from Penn State and saw your article in the Penn State University Alumni Magazine. Congrats on your book, it is wonderful. Do you sign copies of your book? My eight-year-old daughter loves your book. Oh, I sure do. Um, you can get a signed copy when you buy directly from my website because that's inventory that that I physically have here with me. Um, so, yep, CherylWBrooks.com. There's hyphens between the W and Cheryl. Um, but yeah, if you buy directly from me, I'll be happy to sign it. If you want to mail your book to me that you already have and you want it signed, email me. Let's figure something out. Oh, let me give you my email. <laughs> Cheryl at CherylWBrooks.com.
Where can I learn more about the annual event for women to fellowship at Chicken Bone Beach? Yes. So their website is called blackgirlbeachday.com. Yep, blackgirlbeachday.com. Um, and they hold it in August. Was Chicken Bone Beach a sign of pride for the Black community at the time? I believe so. Um, you know, there, there were, there were African Americans in the 30s and the 40s who were also entrepreneurs, who were going to college, uh, things of that nature. But um, I think what what was good for them as a community is that they could take pride in the fact that they built this, you know, from the ground up for themselves. Um, and it ended up being, you know, a blessing to, to their race. So absolutely, they were proud. Um, they were very boastful and proud when I took oral histories. Um, wherever I went with, with my recorder, my microphone, you know, everybody wanted to give their version of what their childhood was like. And um, so, yeah, I, the bulk of the people I talked to, you, you could see the pride beaming in them when they told me, yeah, my mom was a showgirl or my dad owned a, you know, a restaurant and so-and-so came in and they, so yeah, they, they did. I, it definitely, um, they, they, they felt famous back then. Yeah, they, they felt like celebrities. They, they definitely did. They're very proud of what their their families and friends and neighbors were, were able to accomplish. And I sensed, and what I liked is that, and they work together for the greater good. You know, think for example, you know, if you knew Mr. Johnson had the taxi service, well, you, were, you weren't gonna compete with him. You decided to go, I don't know, I'll do a barbershop. You know, Club Harlem ended up being one of the most famous places there. But my uh, my research shows that the owner, he really wanted to be a doctor. And it said, you know, we've already got however many, six Black doctors in this little bitty community. I don't want to compete with them for the needs of this community. So he opened a nightclub. So I really like that part. But yes, they they... They're definitely proud. Were there any instances of documented racism at Chicken Bone Beach? Supposedly, um, Henrietta Shelton, that I've talked about a couple of times, she has in her possession the letter, a copy of one of the letters that went out to the churches um, to let them know that they could only patronize Chicken Bone Beach. Um, I don't recall in all the photos I looked at or conversations, because I, I specifically asked, um, were there any signs around town like for whites only or blacks this? Um, no, but there were things such as this, like, um, someone told me that there was a Blacks only section in the movie theater. So, but I asked my, like, are there any signs? Were there any signs? No. Um, you know, I'm sure there was racism. It's just that it what it 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 had not been documented um for history as much as you know visiting a town and 
Alabama in 1920 or 30. You know, it was it was just more subtle is what everyone said. They may have been told they couldn't go here, um, but I didn't meet anyone that um, told me they, you know, they were ever assaulted or, you know, in like, I didn't hear any really compelling or powerful stories, except maybe um, when I read Chris Colombo, the drummer, um, he talked about his mother. He talked about how bad he felt for her sometimes that she cleaned for a living. And remember, this is the time where there's no unemployment. There's no wage laws yet. So you didn't have to pay some, you weren't forced to pay somebody at least $10 an hour. So many times his mother would come home and dog tired and downtrodden because they paid her what they felt like paying her. She might've worked all day and she knows this was, you know, $5 worth of work, but you know, if her boss gave her 50 cents, she took that 50 cents and she went home. So he did talk about how his mother worked cleaning somewhere in Atlantic City and they and they underpaid her all the time. What was the most fascinating part of the research that you found for this book? <laughs> that I had an aunt who owned a business there <laughs> and I did not know this. I just decided in the, in the midst of my research, I said, you know, I'm going to ask people on social media if they have any stories about Chicken Beach or if they're someone in their family has a story or picture. And I got a few hits. And people in different parts of America were showing me pictures. I would have loved to have put them in the book, but people weren't very timely getting back to me for releases, you know, of, of permission to use their photos. Um, but one of the people that reached out was my own cousin. And she said, my mom had a restaurant in Atlantic City. I'm pretty sure I have some pictures of her at Chicken Bone Beach. I said, you gotta be kidding me. So my honest Thelma, I did put her picture in the book um, and she owned a restaurant. I do not know the name of it and neither does her daughter. And my great uncle uh, was a jazz musician. He's now deceased. And of course, if you're black in the mid 1900s, you're going to where places like Chicken Bone Beach, if you want some work, as a jazz musician. So my great uncle and my great aunt, that's where they met. That's where they courted. Um, and he was there playing and she was a business owner there. So that's, that's huge for me. Um, and most honestly, this is on a personal note. What's really interesting is that, you know, I've been living my whole life just loving beaches and I just never saw this coming. I never knew that one day I would grow up and write about beaches. And sometimes you don't reflect on that journey you've been taking in life until something happens. It's almost like, wow, I, I almost felt destined that someday I would be, I don't know, doing something like this because I grew up loving beaches, loving the water, my grandmother was a, a lifeguard, even though we lived in Cleveland, Ohio. And I mean, I remember I just was always drawn to the water, always wanted to vacation somewhere where there was water. And I used to watch, uh, now you're going to know close to my age. <laughs> so when I was a little kid, they showed these beach movies on TV um, with uh, Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello. And I just, that's where the love, love thing began with beaches. So I, I just think it's um, odd and interesting that something I loved 
all my life, I ended up doing this work and not even realizing that, you know, my, I just kind of drew, I just ended up, I just, I, I just, yeah, I'm just like, wow, I ended up writing about beaches. So. How big was Chicken Bone Beach in the culture of the time? Big as in popular? Like, yeah, did it influence, influence any cultural ah. um, things? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I really think when I hear this uh, term today called the other side of the tracks, like that term didn't make sense to me until I did this research. I don't know if you ever heard that phrase about being from the other side of the tracks kind of thing, but um, Atlantic City was really split racially by the tracks. And so a lot of times when I interviewed folks, they would be making reference to the other side of the tracks. So maybe from a linguistic standpoint, they may have filtered that saying in their own way. Um, they, I think there was an interesting influence as far as illegal gambling. It was told to me that um, the numbers running game, what we legally call the lottery today, my understanding is that it, there were Caribbean Afro-Americans who brought that game to Atlantic City. So I'd, I'd like to think that maybe number running was something that could have possibly trickled down in the community because it was brought there by, by African, uh, another culture. And so they taught the people in their community how to run the numbers. And I'm sure it trickled down to people maybe learning about how to run numbers when they came to visit too. In fact, uh, I don't know if it's brought out in, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen HBO's miniseries Boardwalk Empire, which was based on one of Atlantic City's famous mobsters. But I was also told in my oral histories that um, African Americans brought the number running game to Atlantic City and those people in power with money um, approached those African-Americans and said, hey, you guys are making a lot of money off of this number running thing and uh, we want in. And if you don't let us in, we'll just take it from you. <laughs> so, you know, I feel like culturally um, Blacks influence um, the participation in that gambling scheme in its early days. But yeah, that's, I like that question. I'm going to ponder that for a little longer after this. <laughs> Any more? I don't. I These don't see. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Um, if anybody does have any, you know, we'll give you another minute or two to submit them. I think we just got one. Um, how much of that area is still black owned? Uh, recently has come to light about a lot of communities where blacks thrived and then lost their business through fire, et cetera. Oh, um, I do still frequent Atlantic city quite often. And there are still some black business owners but none still in existence from that particular heyday of its time most of those businesses are are not there because you know uh it, there's a number of things that were transpiring in america uh once the civil rights act was passed many people left atlantic city both white and black um a lot of Blacks who were in a position economically, they finally wanted, you know, to rent 
or own a much larger place because um, from an income standpoint, Blacks in Atlantic City back then, they were stacked on each other like starting. There's, there were a lot of apartments. Um, there wasn't, you know, you didn't see a lot. You didn't see neighborhoods with, you know, a garage and grass and yard. So people wanted to finally, you know, have their piece of the American dream, white picket fence. So they left. And when they left, they they closed their businesses. And when people were free to go everywhere, they weren't necessarily choosing to go to Chicken Bone Beach anymore. So a lot of the businesses uh, closed as a result of the severe decline in tourism in Atlantic City. Um, I've been to a few Black-owned businesses there, restaurants in particularly, but I am not aware of like fires or, or any current events of that nature. Oh, let me tell you this though. I did just think of something. There is another Chicken Bone Beach within Atlantic City. And I say that to say that is in some ways a cultural thing. And let me explain. So yes, Blacks still go to Missouri Avenue Beach as any race, um, but a younger generation, like maybe Blacks in their 20s in, uh, in Atlantic City in 19 and 18, they picked a different spot to hang out. So they still hang out on the beach in Atlantic City, but they are sitting on another spot in the, in, on the beach somewhere, I don't know where. And they call wherever it is they're gathering. I think they're, I heard they call it Little Chicken Bone Beach, but it's funny how the name took on its own life. So it's not, there's a physical Chicken Bone Beach and apparently Chicken Bone Beach is wherever Blacks are hanging out in the moment. So young people, they don't want to hang out at Missouri Avenue Beach. They want to hang out somewhere else, but they're taking the name because this is where we Blacks are hanging out now. This is Chicken Bone Beach. So I thought that was interesting. All right, I don't see any more questions. So I think we can go ahead and end the presentation there. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for, for speaking with us today and sharing you know, the background of your research and all the insights that you found. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And again, thank you all for attending today. I hope you found this informative and kind of a, a look back in history that we can all appreciate, especially you know, being, being in New Jersey. So. Um, again, if anybody has any further questions, you can please contact Cheryl um, at her at her information on the screen there. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. Be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you.